Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Addo. And uh, yeah, um, so I'm, you know, going to uh, expand the patient pool a little bit. Um, you know, we have all seen uh, some fascinating cardio uh, coronary cases, you know, an excellent review of a lot of peripheral arterial disease. Um, and just a little bit uh, um, on uh, venous interventions, uh, which, you know, I think um, are patients that uh, we see often in our capacity as cardiovascular physicians. So um, I'm going to go through a quick case. Uh, this is a 60-year-old uh, female. She presents with progressive shortness of breath and lightheadedness. She had seen a PCP who had started her on um, antibiotics for presumed pneumonia. She has, uh, you know, multiple comorbidities, hypertension, hypothyroidism. She also had a recent lower GI bleed, but now the hemoglobin was stable, COPD, um, GERD. So this is her um, EKG on presentation, and um, as many of you in the audience will see, she's uh, tachycardic. Her blood pressure is kind of borderline, but then she has a classical S1, Q3, T3 pattern on her EKG, uh, which was very suggestive of a <clears throat> pulmonary embolus. She um, um, also had a CTA, which confirmed that, and over here, you can see the arrows indicate uh, the presence of large thrombus, both in the right side as well as the left uh, lobar arteries. So this was an echo, and this is one of the very disturbing signs, and <clears throat> also one of the reasons why these patients are very important to us um, as cardiologists is that she had very, very severe um, RV hypokinesis, um, and the RV, in fact, if you can see, appreciate, is almost twice the size of the, um, of the LV, which is obviously uh, not normal. So um, <clears throat> we took her to the lab, um, and uh, she underwent pulmonary angiography first to confirm the findings. And you can see over here there are multiple uh, opacities. Uh, this, you know, so this is the, the the right superior, right middle, and the right lower uh, branches. And you can see there's there's a lot of uh, echolucencies, which represents basically the presence of severe amount of thrombus. So she underwent uh, a little bit of uh, um, uh, balloon inflation, and then we used um, AngioJet TPA. Um, to try and uh, clean up the vasculature and the thrombus as much as possible. Uh, and then this is the <clears throat> result at the end uh, that we got at the procedure. Uh, and then um, this is uh, something called the ECOS catheter, uh, which is basically an infusion catheter that you leave in overnight. It has um, an echo core, um, and that, that's the core that you're seeing with the markers over there that allows for better penetration um, of the drug into the thrombus. So we left, uh, we infused from the neck um, uh, you know, TPA through this ECOS catheter. Uh, and the dose, if you see, is about a fifth of what you would give for systemic lysis. So systemically, you, you might give as much as 100 milligrams um, IV uh, for, uh, which is usually reserved for massive PE. In this case, we usually give one to two milligrams an hour or 12 hours. So <clears throat> most patients get about, uh, you know, 12 to 18 milligrams of TPA, which is, again, significantly lower than what a systemic dose is and thereby also reduces um, the systemic absorption and the systemic side effects of lytics. So um, this patient then, um, uh, sorry, so this patient then had a follow-up CTA at uh, 72 hours, and you can see most of the thrombus is resolved. There's just a little bit um, left here in the distal portion to the right, as well as the left, um, and the echo also, again, showing significant improvement in RV function and size. Um, and so just a quick word, uh, you know, Annually, it is estimated just in the U.S. that 4 million surgical patients and 8 million so-called medical patients are at moderate to severe risk of PE. 42% of medical patients and 64% of surgical patients, especially for orthopedic procedures, etc., admitted are at risk for PE. And, you know, these are the classic risk factors for uh, venous thromboembolic disease, including having had a previous episode, prolonged bed rest, having central venous catheters, and cancer. So um, <clears throat> what, I, what I want to... Uh, leave you behind is the, the message is that just like acute coronary syndromes, we're very used to using risk stratification scores. Not all PEs are the same. There's a very wide spectrum of clinical manifestations. Um, at one, you know, at kind of the ones that we commonly see are the subsegmental ones, they're hemodynamically tolerated. Um, they're out not in the low bar or in the main arteries. Uh, and those you treat with anticoagulation and do very well. About 4 to 5 percent of the PEs are massive PEs. Those are the ones that are presenting with PEA arrest and shock. Um, and those have a very, very high 90-day mortality of 58 percent. But a very large proportion uh, of about 30 to 50 percent are like the case I showed you. They're called submassive PEs. Um, and those are the ones that have evidence of RV strain uh, without a hemodynamic compromise. So their blood pressure is 100, 110 systolic, not necessarily hypotensive. 
Um, and it is estimated that about 10% of these will progress to massive BEs. The 90-day mortality is 21%, so very, very high. And what I want to uh, you know, drive home is that RV strain is pretty, um, it's very liberal in terms of how we define it. So either on echo or CT, the way I showed you, or even if they're troponin positive or BNP positive without another reason for it, then that is an evidence of RV strain, and that defines a submassive PE. So again, the treatment classically for PE has been anticoagulation, systemic lytics, uh, but now there's increasingly a role for catheter-directed lytics, uh, and then obviously surgical embolectomy in the right patient. These are some of the different um, tools that we have, uh, you know, where you try to macerate the thrombus a little bit, and then you can do lytics um, like uh, the um, patient I just showed you. Stenting is almost never required because it's an acute problem with acute resolution. So um, to end, what is what does the AHA, what do the guidelines say? A lot of the data on the use of uh, catheter-directed lytics has actually come in the last two years, and the statement is from 2000 level, so the guidelines um, kind of lag behind the evidence. Right now, it's a class 2A in massive PE, uh, meaning it can be considered, and class 2B, meaning it is reasonable in patients with submassive PE. But I encourage you uh, to think about these patients uh, and, uh, you know, pursue aggressive therapy for these patients um, when appropriate. Thank you. a couple of cases. Uh, I'll start, uh, switch back to the arterial world, and then um, jump to a, another venous case if we have time. Sorry. So we'll start with this um, um, uh, patient. Um, he's an 82-year-old man with uh, Rutherford stage 4 PAD. Um, prior tobacco use, uh, has a history of coronary disease with myocardial infarction in the past. About a year and a half ago, had uh, an, an unclear embolic event that led to right to visual loss. That was never really um, the etiology of, of this um, um, embolism was never really clarified. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, peripheral arterial disease. He had had multiple uh, repairs, endovascular repairs, of, of bilateral uh, su uh, superficial femoral arteries and uh, had had multiple reocclusions, specifically of his left uh, SFA. Uh, and that had, uh, had uh, posed significant problems for him from a symptom standpoint um, uh, over and over. His right leg was, uh, was not as much of an issue. Um, uh, after his third uh, instant re-stenotic re occlusion of his SFA, he underwent uh, creation of a, of a, a fempop uh, on that side. And this is the angiogram a few days later after presenting with acute left foot pain. And you can see slow flow through this bypass and then thrombus the distal edge of it, and then run off into his distal vessels. The interventional cardiologist, uh, this is from an outside institution, uh, went ahead and treated this with aspiration thrombectomy and then implanted a short Viabond stent, that's a cover stent there. Um, he did well for about a week and then re-occluded this. Um, and and uh, the interventional cardiologist elected not to do anything further. Um, and he uh, basically uh, was treated medically. The surgeon did not want to re-bypass him, and so he had been li living with uh, severe uh, left leg pain, rest pain, and some um, uh, paresthesias of his left foot uh, as well, and so he was referred in for consideration of uh, further uh, treatment. So, of course, we all know critical limb ischemia uh, carries a poor prognosis if left untreated, uh, these patients have high global cardiovascular risks, and tissue loss uh, can ensue and, and lead to gangrene, sepsis, limb loss, and, and even death. And so the treatment goals for these patients, of course, are going to be restoration of flow, resolution of pain, and avoid limb loss, especially in our older population. We, we know very well that uh, mobility becomes very important as our patients uh, age, and, um, and quality of life uh, will be... Uh, 
reduced if, if, um, if this occurs in our patients. And so um, just pointing out uh, what we're dealing with here, you can see these are my angiograms uh, now. He has osteoectopic occlusion. He has a profunda that you can see is uh, large and will, will continue down to give some uh, collateral flow to his distal, uh, to his popliteal uh, vessel. You can see the beginning of his um, stent, first SFA stent into the SFA that continues down and ends at uh, the mid SFA. You can see some faint filling of the SFA at that point from collateral vessels, but then reocludes and then another stented segment of the distal SFA and reconstitution of the popliteal. So um, we had discussed in clinic uh, um, forms of, of treating this and he, because of his experience with his previous uh, surgery, did not want to undergo surgery again, uh, although I felt that was a, a, an important consideration. So I, I brought him to the lab. Like the, the technique, again, is going to be a little compl complex here because we want to re-enter the lumen of an occluded stent but having uh, an occluded segment proximal to that poses some challenge. And so you see me sort of uh, knuckling wires through the, through the proximal stent. I exit the space in between the two stents subintimally and then re-entering uh, this distal stent, the true lumen, again, uh, is very complicated. And this has uh, posed the, the most of the challenge for me, actually. Um, and so this is actually a coronary CTO wire, the back end of it. Um, I used that to re-enter and, and followed uh, with a microcatheter. I exited the, the stent subintimally and then had to re-enter right, right above the knee uh, using the, the Outback device, which um, is sitting in a subintimal space and you see a coronary wire enter um, uh, one of the distal uh, vessels here. And so after stenting, of course, uh, multiple uh, balloon angioplasties uh, throughout the existing stent. I avoided re-stenting the old stented segments and only focally stented the most resistant uh, areas. Of course, he has not done well with, with stenting procedures, and so I wanted to avoid uh, multiple stent implantations. Uh, I treated the proximal SFA with just directional atherectomy and adjunctive uh, balloon angioplasty. I wanted to avoid stenting uh, uh, in the proximal segment, especially since he had some distal common femoral disease, um, and uh, so that I would spare uh, the profunda, the source of collateral to his distal uh, leg. And you see a decent result throughout, leading to a three-vessel runoff. Uh, he was very happy. I was very happy. This, happened, this took me about four and a half hours. Uh, uh, but we were all very happy, and unfortunately, uh, eight hours later, um, he develops acute left foot pain, and um, I brought him back to the to the lab. Uh, of course, the duplex uh, ultrasound showed re-acute occlusion of his um, entire SFA with barely uh, any uh, flow in his infrapopliteal vessels. So now we're dealing with a patient who uh, initially had a critical limb ischemia and now has acute limb ischemia uh, related to the intervention that I performed. Um, given uh, the extent, and I'm interested to hear what others would do uh, who live in this world, um, given the extent of thrombus in this leg, um, I elected not to perform any uh, balloon angioplasty or um, thrombectomy uh, in the lab uh, with concerns for distal embolization and then uh, finishing off uh, his limb, essentially. And so I elected to, uh, to perform catheter-directed thrombolysis with the ECOS catheter, all to place uh, infusion at one milligram an hour, uh, some heparin through the sheep, um, and continued his uh, oral DAPT and uh, followed fibrinogen levels. Brought him back to the lab uh, 24 hours later. Um, by hour six, he had shown signs of reperfusion. Um, uh, you could uh, detect a pulse. Unfortunately, by hour 18, he had uh, shown signs of reperfusion injury at that point. Uh, his uh, limb was edematous and um, his uh, compartments became an issue. This, unfortunately, I don't have the DSA images, but you can see this is after 24 hours of, of uh, a catheter directed thrombolysis. I have um, uh, re um, reperfused the leg and have three vessels uh, distally. You can see, and he's, his compartments are pretty tight at this point, so the vessels are, are quite thin down there. And so my vascular colleagues were uh, um, on the case early on in this process and uh, took him for, for compartment fasciotomy. Um, uh, he did uh, well after that. Uh, his his um, 
uh, vessel remained patent uh, for the rest, the rest of the hospitalization. And then the issue became, how do you treat uh, this long-term from a med medical standpoint? And, and I elected to treat him with aspirin, clopidogrel, and uh, Coumadin. Um, after his uh, fasciotomy incisions were closed, uh, he walked out of the hospital. And this was about four months ago. I, and I uh, recently spoke with him. He's doing well. His surgical incisions have healed, and uh, his uh, vessel appears open based on symptoms anyway. Um, the, the lesson here, I think, for, for me is um, even after uh, things look beautiful, um, uh, bad things can happen. And in patients who, who specifically have critical limb ischemia, uh, to begin with, uh, acute uh, limb ischemia may portend a, a bad uh, prognosis for them. So thank you very much. Thank you.